Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone out there in Facebook land. This is Susan Gerbic, and I'm in conversation with uh, uh, Janice Boynton. This is the second, third time that I've talked to Janice Boynton, who is an expert on facilitated communication, which we will call FC, and rapid prompting method, which is, we're going to be calling it RPM. And uh, thank you for joining us. We're going to have a really interesting conversation today with Catherine Beals, who is uh, going to introduce herself to us instead of me reading her, her, uh, her uh, biography, but she is an expert on um, language and this is really important that we understand how language is how we how we um, acquis acquire language and um, and it, in our discussion about rapid prompting method and facilitated communication but this is going to be really interesting. We're going to try to go jargon free as much as possible <laughs> and if you guys want to make comments in the in the in the chat that I'll be watching on my Facebook page. And I am going to uh, watch the comments there. Keep in mind that I can only see like the last five comments before it falls off of my, my area where I can't see it anymore. So if I am not asking the question you want asked, you might need to ask it a second time. So Catherine, give us a little bit of hello. Who, who are you? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I think it cut off for a second. Um, so I'm Catherine Beals. I originally trained as a, as a general theoretical linguist. Um, and then I had a son with autism and retooled as an autism linguist as I started to notice the challenges that he was having acquiring language. And uh, ultimately, I developed a, a software tool to teach him language and also developed a couple of classes at the, both the Penn and the Drexel Ed Schools where I teach uh, questions of language acquisition and autism. I'm a little more broadly interested also in just the educational process of, uh, that kids uh, on the autism spectrum go through at school. And I've of course become very interested in facilitated communication, which I had thought was long gone and then I started <laughs> noticing that it had come back. So, so that's, 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 that's really, it. this is going to be really interesting, <laughs> especially since it's apply, you use it to apply to your own experience. This should yeah. be very good. Now, so keep in mind, everybody out there watching. So Janice and Catherine are going to explain things to me. And if I get it, then we're probably at the right, at the level where we need to be in the basics. Even though I do know a lot about facilitated communication and rapid prompting method just in the years of hanging out with Janice but, um, and reading everything. But uh, this should be great. So where should we start? Uh, well, I think we should... Um talk a little bit about what FC and RPM are probably for if anybody's new. I know there are people that have heard me talk um, before about it, um, but I'd also like to get into like how people typically develop language and, and maybe some of the, the issues that people with autism have that prevent them or make it more difficult to, maybe that's the direction we can go in if that makes sense. Okay. Janice, do you want to give the introduction to what rapid prompting method and sure, RPM well, is? And rapid prompting method are, are um, two techniques that people are using right now with people with severe communication difficulties. And basically it involves a facilitator, which is generally an adult who has um, typically developed language and a person with disabilities. Um, and the, the, the idea behind FC and RPM is that you, the facilitator provides physical and emotional support. Um, with FC, it's, it's physical touch, um, holding a wrist or an elbow or shoulder while they type. And then um, with rapid prompting method, it's typically the facilitator holds a, a letter board up and the person with disabilities um, touches the letters on the, on the letter board as a, as a facilitator is holding it in the air um, and, and it's yeah there's a lot of problems with it um, that we <laughs> you <talked> think about, <laughs> yeah, um, previously in terms of facilitator cueing um, but then um, there's also in terms of um, I think what we'll focus on mostly today is that anytime that the facilitator is influencing the communication it's it's um, 
preventing the person with disabilities from truly uh, from learning some skills that they need to communicate effectively and independently. So that dependence that's built upon the facilitator um, is really a detriment in terms of a person with autism or other disabilities that in terms of um, they're using language independently. Uh, it, Catherine, is that how you perceive it as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, one thing that we encountered with raising our son was a whole bunch of, of therapies that, you know, who knows, maybe they work, maybe they don't. But the problem with this particular one is that it actually interferes with other options, other paths you might take. So you could do the diet. There's a special diet that some people put their kids on and do other things also. You could do uh, various other things, but continue to educate your child in, in reading and writing and literacy and language. But the problem with going the FC route is that you're cutting off other options and you're spending, this is sort of how you've decided your child is going to communicate. So the stakes are quite a bit higher with that particular route than, than for other routes. That's and, a really and, yeah. good point. I'd never and, really thought about that before. Yeah, so we've had some of these other things, but because, you know, you, I can certainly put myself in the mindset of a parent with a child with autism. And, and if something hasn't been disproved yet, you're like, well, what's the worst that it could happen if you put your kid on a gluten-free diet for a week and see what happens, you know, or try neurofeedback, which is another thing we tried. You know, what's the worst that could happen? But, but when there's real, a real opportunity cost, then, you know, I mean, what I would like to think is that if someone had tried to talk me into doing FC or RPM, which never happened, I would have thought, okay, well, let's do a message passing test right away and <laughs> <laughs> see if this really is my son. You know, so do, uh, do you want to explain what a message passing test is for people who haven't seen the past videos? Sure, yeah. I, I mean, you might be able to explain it better than me, but, but I would say just in a very rough way, the idea is that you want to make sure that the person being facilitated is the one answering the questions. And the way to do that is to ask a question that the facilitator wouldn't know the answer to. And there are various ways you could do that. Uh, and, and so I would, you know, I, I would probably be happy with a pretty informal experiment, but I would try to think of something that I wouldn't know the answer to. And then we would ask, you know, my son <laughs> that question. Do you think this is done often? And we just don't hear about it because it's done early in and interventions at the be beginning at the, at the time. And we don't hear about it later because who's going to test somebody they've already been working with and they bought into it for you know yeah. a year or yeah. more. But at the beginning, do we think people are doing that and it's just like, oh, that didn't work. And then they move on to something else. Yeah. And then we're, and then the people who stick with it are selected for true belief or, mm -hmm. or you know, they're not. Yeah. I, I, I wondered about that. I've been thinking a lot lately about the people at the very beginning of the whole pipeline, you know, parents who just get the diagnosis and who are they hearing from first and what information are they getting? And I think that one thing that really needs to happen is that the psychotherapists who are diagnosing these kids need to get them, give them a heads up about, you know, maybe not the diet, because that's like, you know, not a big deal sort of, but facilitated communication because it is such a big deal. Show, someone needs to be walking parents through some of the most compelling videos that they might encounter on their own and showing them, hey, look, you may not have noticed this, but look what's going on. Um, because, yeah, I, I think that people, especially when they have a kid who doesn't seem to be responding right away to other therapies, they are going to start looking around at what's out there. And if they haven't yet heard that it's bad, they might you know, think that it's reasonable. That's a really good point. Can you imagine, wouldn't that be great if we could intervene right at the beginning and say, well, with a lot of therapies, um, same with uh, people who are diagnosed with cancer and or you know, anything of the sort, and they could say, so um, we want to prepare you, you may end up hearing uh, that these kinds of things are going to, people are going to suggest alternative medicine for you, and here's kind of, you know, a way of uh, learning about it before it becomes a problem, you know. That's interesting. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. I think one thing I've learned from cognitive science research is that you have to get people before they commit. You have to get in there before they, because it's very hard, I think we've all seen, it's very hard to talk people out of it who are mm -hmm. already committed to it. Inoculate so, them from the pseudoscience. Exactly, right at the beginning, right at the huh. beginning. Very good, I like this idea. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, like, 
some of the things that I've read in the FC literature, the proponent literature, is that they they really um, wonder and doubt um, like the practical experience and knowledge of people who are critical of facilitated communication. So I'm wondering if you, Catherine, would talk a little bit about your experience and what kind of what you bring to the table, because I think um, I know a little bit about so you shared with me some of the things the things that you've been through um and to me that that adds credibility because i'm not a parent with a person with i'm not a parent at all so you know it's except like for the uh, teddy bear you're holding uh, <laughs> <laughs> which he'll come into play in a little bit but um people are wondering why is she holding a teddy why bear, am I holding a teddy bear? <laughs> um my buddy it's my buddy he's adorable uh, and cuddly uh, looking but, but <laughs> go ahead but, uh, sorry um and, and to me, when I early on, I was I was a facilitator um, in the early 1990s. And if you go to the workshops, and I, I think it, it it's still true to a degree, is that um, the the message that you get from these workshops is that anybody who doubts facilitated communication must be against people with disabilities. They must not have the experience or the expertise to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so part of what interests me about talking with you, Catherine, is that that you kind of break those myth for me, break those myths. You know, it's like you're somebody who is trained and also a parent. Um, so I'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think I've always been sort of a skeptic about a lot of things and I've been trained to become a skeptic in particular about thing, claims about language. So one of the things that we were hearing early on from one of the uh, psycho people, psycho professionals who we saw, who gave us ultimately the diagnosis was, oh, you know, he's actually understanding a lot more than you think he is. And I was thinking, actually, I don't agree with that. I think that he's, un he's not taking this stuff in. He's not tuning in. You know, everything I know about language, you, you don't just have it going on in the background. You, you have to tune it in. And, and actually that leads me to one other Thing that we didn't do that I sensed right away was not going to be a fr fruitful route for us to take and it is sort of in the direction of FC which is this approach to autism called floor time and that had um, people like Stanley Greenspan who's no longer with us but a whole group of people advocating for it and it doesn't involve pseudoscience really but what the assumption is is that there is a locked-in child so you know it's very tempting to believe that mm -hmm. and that what you have to do is to, to unlock the child is to get on down on the floor with the child and play and follow the child's lead and so on and so forth. You know, some of which is is good advice, but it assumes that that's all you need to do to unlock the child. That that, that there's some sort of a, an emotional motor disconnect, which sounds familiar, right? Because that's also said with FC. And so the problem with floor time isn't that you're doing something that that is deceptive and you, you, you end up with these warped beliefs about your child. The problem with floor time is it doesn't get you very far because there's very little direct instruction. So you could waste a lot. This is an example of something that you could waste a lot of time on and we were encouraged to kind of do. And I was skeptical about it from the beginning because for me, it was quite obvious that a child like our son was not tuning in to stuff and the approach had to involve making him tune in. And, and so that predisposed me to be, uh, you know, even more critical of anything like FC. I though didn't hear about FC at all until much later, you know, so we went through all his early years without even knowing that, that people were still doing this. And I actually first heard about it without quite knowing what it was when uh, a colleague, a linguist, a colleague of mine said, you know, oh, you're developing this text-based program to teach your son, because that's what we ended up doing. I, I created a computer program for him that would draw his attention in. And she said, oh, well, I have a colleague um, who, a linguist colleague who has a son who, maybe kind of like your son, he's completely nonverbal, but he, he learned to type, and now he's communicating everything oh. under the sun. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> what made me skeptical was, I was like, well, then that's not autism, right? Because autism is not a motor disorder. <laughs> that, 
brilliant right there. <laughs> you would think that that would catch you, right? It, okay, got it. That, yep. Yeah, and then I, later on, I found out that in fact, um, this they this family does use FC. Um, I, at first, I thought. I guess he doesn't have autism, but I think the truth is that the child has autism and uses FC, but that was left out. Um, but at the time, wow. I, I, I didn't even, I had no idea. I, I first heard about this probably in 2002 or three or something, and I started hearing about Mm. about it happening in, in sort of in my, in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because the, um, the, it was debunked in the middle of the 1990s, like 94, 95 is when American Speech, Hearing, um, and Language Association put out their, and um, American Psychological Association put out their um, policies opposing FC. And so it kind of, and the, the um, frontline prisoners of silence um, came out in 1993 and that really um, did some damage in terms of the, the the upward trend of facilitated communication because before that it was all in the press it was all look at this miracle cure we're unlocking people's silence you know that kind of stuff and and um when those when the negative press started coming out it went underground and the science community mm -hmm. thought well we've debunked it because that's when od heck center that they did and then there were some others that followed and so for the science community and the skeptical community they were pretty sure that it was facilitator authored and they and they had enough evidence in the in the testing that had been done so um it went underground but the fc people continued to practice and they kind mm -hmm. of flourished and so about the time that you were hearing about it again if you i, <laughs> I um there was an upward curve in yeah. terms of of it, they they went underground for a while, and then in the two thousand early two thousands, they started really heavily promoting it again because they had gone through this period where nobody was looking. Right. So, so, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I and, mean, when I first heard someone mention it, I was like, "Wait, facilitated communication wasn't that debunked? Is, is this the same? Are we talking about the same thing?" Because I think I actually did watch that frontline up you know series when it first came out. Um, so so. Yeah, I, and, 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 sh and this person who was telling me about it didn't seem to know or seem to maybe say, well, it's different now or oh. some of those arguments. Well, they, they say that, they say that um, rapid prompting method is different yeah. than FC. And yeah. that's, that's how we're starting to now, we're starting, uh, you know, enough time had gone by so that there was a new crop of believers that were coming mm -hmm. out. Yeah. And that's what's happening now too. Um, yeah. And, and so we're starting to meet people who say well facilitated communication is isn't real but but rapid prompting method is that's what i've heard so they're they've switched their focus on it you know it's sort of it's, it's they changed the name but, too yeah i think yeah, in another, supported typing they they don't believe in fc but they believe in supported right. typing. Oh, yeah. the and name. a lot of people will actually yeah. say oh yeah we know fc is bunk this is this is different and they'll even cite all the articles showing that fc is bunk and then they'll talk about RPM. I think another <laughs> thing to watch for that's wow. really alarming is how um, rapid prompting or, and or FC, to the extent that it involves high-tech keyboards, can kind of uh, combine with text prediction, word prediction software so that the cues are going to be even more subtle and even more hard for lay people to see. So in some of the more recent videos, you sometimes all you see is the mother next to the, or the facilitator next to the person with their eyes glued to the keyboard, of course. And, and then the person's maybe just picking between one, to, one or three choices of the next predicted word. But if you don't, if you're not thinking at all skeptically, you're going to, you're going to get taken in by that. Mm -hmm. So I think text prediction is going to be a nightmare for, for people like us. Well, I think there's, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's two problems with it. One is like, how does the, how do those messages get into the, you know, yeah. get programmed into the technology to begin with? Yeah. And then how much control does the person real or, or um, capacity does the person have to actually interact with the keyboard on their own? Yeah. You know, do they need the facilitator to even understand which button to press? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really tricky. If you watch the, um, 
United Nations presentations, that was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. But it, it was all RPM. So, you know, you don't know how independent those messages were, or who actually put those messages into the keyboard to begin with, into the communication device to begin with. Right. You know, we're playing with uh, emotions here. Um, that's what's going on. Is there Apple, as we know, we showed last time we did a talk, Apple is using facilitated communication to sell their product. It's a huge feel good moment. You watch these things and you're emotionally attached. Wow, this guy's, he was locked in, you know, and now he can type. And it doesn't dawn on you that they're showing you extreme close ups of a finger hitting a keyboard, but you don't really see him typing. You just see, um, a, a bit of movement you can't tell that if their hand is being held and they're pointing to something you can't you're not understanding why are they holding the keyboard in the air why is a letter board in the air? that doesn't make any sense why is this child who's able to do all these other amazing things physically he can obviously um, um, you know hold things and, and touch things and eat and feed himself why does he need to be prompted to to push a button why can't the thing just sit in front of him and he types there's these questions aren't being asked because it just feels really good to know that this person is now successful in writing poetry and going to school and we figured it out but we don't see the harm and we don't see how we're being manipulated emotionally and that these poor children are are you know that's it that that's in you know they're gonna this is the only thing they're gonna know yeah it's yeah. horrible one of the creepiest things for me as a parent was to learn only relatively recently that it's not just fully nonverbal kids who are going down this route. It's kids who were kind of at a point where my son was way back when. And imagine if he'd had a parent who fell for it and compare where he is now and where he would be if he were using RPM or FC all these years. You know, it's just, it's really um, creepy to think about that. So he's what what skills that he, he's ver is he verbal and oh yeah yeah. yeah yeah he uh well <laughs> he's a Wikipedia editor of course <laughs> uh, <he doesn't laughs> <It's> so funny <laughs> I was reading about his exploits and that just makes me laugh <laughs> and smile the same agenda as as you guys do you know he's not after pseudoscience he's more interested in inserting information about ceiling fans into random you know like. <laughs> for example, so this will give you a sense of his verbal skills. He, he, he might go to uh, the Wikipedia entry on, on uh, beach houses, and then he'll go in and, and he'll find a paragraph and he'll insert, some beach houses have ceiling fans. And, you know, and then I ask him, how long did that stay? You know, because usually <laughs> a day or two. <laughs> it's a reliable source. Yeah. <laughs> No, or he'll insert links to his own thing. He's got his own ceiling fan archive going on on, on the web. But yeah, he, he's so verbal that he can, you know, he can hijack one of our phones and pretend to be someone else, you know. Ooh. So he'll try to set up a visit to see someone's ceiling fans, pretending that I'm, you know, it's me, me calling on his behalf. And uh, so he's gotten really, language has really opened up a, a huge world for him and, and lots of ways good and bad you know, but i think they're all good really yeah uh, yeah janice and i attended a webinar where somebody from the facilitating communication world was trying to to open it up to down syndrome children oh. that was egregiously difficult to watch and people were kind of sort of pushing back on this woman like why are we using this with down syndrome people then <laughs> Oh, it's a really good idea. We should explore it. it. Was I think basically what she said. I don't think it went any further than that, but you never know. Well, didn't Rosemary Crosley start out with a cerebral palsy child? That was her yeah. first. Mm -hmm. So it, it yeah. well, didn't start out with autism. And actually, in a way, with CP, it kind of makes more theoretical sense because that is a movement disorder, at least partly. Yeah, she was. Well, they're trying to make athlete. everything a movement disorder now, though. They yeah. were trying to, yeah. in the workshop we, we took, they were trying to make um, a case for Down syndrome to be a movement disorder wow. as well. So they're, they're sort of generalizing to, to fit what they want FC and RPM to be. Mm -hmm. Wow. But, which I think is terrifying. But. Yeah. Speaking of the feel good aspect, um, what I've seen as, as a professor is not only, it's not just the parents who feel great watching these things, but I'll show some of these videos in class and I don't say ahead of time, 
what's going on. And my students really want to believe. They really, really want to believe. And they don't like it when I start explaining to them how it's probably not real. Oh. Uh, so I think we have a deep seated cultural, and I, and I don't know if we're more like this as Americans than the British. I've heard the British are a little more skeptical, but who knows? Yeah. No, uh, yeah, no, I think, I, I don't know. I think it can be generalized, but there was a, a study done in um, 1998 that looked at the, um, they had college students and they had a confederate, um, a, a person with disabilities that pretended to, to um, not be verbal. And um, he didn't know, he didn't know the story that they told, I think it was he, didn't know the story that the, the students were given about him. So he didn't have details about his life, you know, like brothers oh, and sisters, interesting. Or, you know, hobbies or that kind of stuff. And, um, and they ended up facilitating with this person. And I think it was 80 and they showed the, they showed, they showed the front line they showed in parts of all, or all of it. I can't remember. I'd have to go back and look at the study, but the gist of it was that 80% of the people, even though they had doubts, 80% of the people came came out of that situation believing that they facilitated with the person wow and that so and that was that was a college class and they so it's it's you you want and um uh daniel wegner is another he did a study on um uncontrolled intelligence he called it with facilitated communication and just the belief you don't have to be a fanatic to fall for FCRPM, just the belief that it could work increases the chances that it does work. And once you have that feedback, then you're more likely to continue using it. So it doesn't take much at all. It just, it's just a really desired help is really what pulls people in. Yeah. Um, so. And to be clear, I think that facilitators do really want to help. They're not okay. entering this as a, oh, gee, let's scam a bunch of people and let's scam the medical profession out of money. And let's, you know, I, I really think that they are entering into this in a desire to help. Yeah, I think the rank and file, I, I have a little bit more uh, doubts about the leadership. Well, once you, yeah. But I, I, do, I do agree that the rank and file facilitator um, whether it's a parent or a, an educator or caregiver definitely is, is really just wanting to help out. One thing I've wondered about with these very carefully edit, de edited deceptive videos is to what extent are the people who are editing those videos aware that they're, you know, are these the true believers who are editing, you know, so, cause sometimes it's a parent who puts up a video. So are they even as a true believer manipulating you know consciously manipulating things to make things look more convincing i don't think so the stuff we've seen on on uh, the internet i keep pointing out and like they uploaded this this is not a sting done by the science community yeah. or the skeptic community this is they think this is good work you know and they'll yeah. put it up and you're looking at them and they're and just the basics where the child is not looking at the keyboard yeah. Yeah. they're looking over here and yet they're typing or whatever and i think to myself you could edit that out i mean why <laughs> would you put that up and then i think about places like apple and um, other commercials who are trying to sell their tablet i'm sure they realize what they've edited out and and yeah. only keeping in there is the quality stuff and the people who went to the homes to to film it they have to realize that this yeah. is not okay but they you know what are you going to say you work for a company they say we, we want a video who am I going to say that I, I you know, who's going to speak out yeah. and say, well, you know, I don't think this is really good. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it, if it looks like it's going to get into the conversation about disability rights and, and stuff. Ooh, you, yeah. You're in a situation where somebody's going to accuse you of, of not, not supporting people with disabilities. You're not going to say a thing. But, you know, I think that there's an easy retort to that, which is, you know, what if this is actually a hijacking of people's voices? The evidence is yeah happening. exactly yeah so that's 100%. what i think and yeah. and so the people on twitter who have the hashtag i stand with non-speakers and they're pro fc and i sometimes use the hashtag i stand with non-speakers as an anti-fc person because <laughs> you know it's 
Well, they're, they're writing them out. They're completely forgetting about that person. I mean, yeah. again, they're, they're, they're ignoring their voice and they're saying, well, he, he speaks there and says that he's, that he's understand. I mean, it's a circular reasoning. It's like, well, how do you yeah. know he's speaking about it? He's actually speaking. Well, because he said he's actually speaking. Yeah. Well, how do you know that's coming from him? Well, because he says it's coming from him. <laughs> yeah. We well, yeah, um, no uh, argument. You can't. You can't win. I'm right. writing an article with someone, uh, with some people about um, a um, a research study that just came out about rapid prompting method, mm -hmm. and uh, we can talk about that at a different time. Um, but we asked the 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 authors of the paper, why do you? Because because of all the issues of um, facilitator influence that are known, and one of them is that if if you've got a if you've got a board in the air, the facilitator can't help but move it around, you know, and that, and that's going to influence the the person who where they tie, where they point to. Um, we asked them why do you hold it in the air, and they said because we do. That was their <laughs> answer. I, I said that's got to be a huge point in that in the article. We yeah. hold it in the air because that's how we do it. That's how we do it. And so they're not, they're not interested. The, the, that, that's why I have a little bit of, um, I hold back a little bit about the, the leadership and some of the academics yeah. in, this art, in this debate is that their purpose, it seems to be purposefully avoiding the issue of facilitator influence and, and why yeah. that, that's an issue. Well, and I think if in the case of some academics, if they have a personal stake because perhaps they have a child who uses it, then maybe they're manipulating themselves as well. So maybe they, they, they just don't want to go there because they can't go there, you know, cognitive yeah. dissonance. So yeah. I think that, that, that there are a couple of cases of, of, you know, unfortunately psychology people who have been, who then end up with a child that they can't come to terms with in the scientific way that you might and, and go down this path. And then every, all their research is, ends up being compromised, but they're not necessarily out there to get, you know, money from the rest of us, but but just because that's how they cope with what happened. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, I think that's a whole other topic for psychology. Actually, is you know what does it do to a parent to have a severely nonverbal autistic child? I I'm not one to comment on that because we were lucky, but you know I think it really does a number on you. And and there are some people who can come to terms with that as is, and other people who need to you know invent things uh, in order to cope. And um, someone should look at that. Yeah, totally I agree. Think the, the promoters, we that same workshop that Susan and I, the webinar that Susan and I sat in on, the FC was being promoted as the the technique of last resort. Yeah. So, so there's an awareness that that these parents who are drawn to this technique, these techniques, have tried everything else, and there must be a lot of anguish and torment yeah. um, in that process of going through, like you build up hope that this technique or that technique is going to help this time and, and, and it doesn't. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like, and, and these people are, are, you know, they're going to, they want to do anything they can for their yeah. child, you know, and it, it's sort of like, it's, it is that psychological draw, you know, yeah. and, and, mm -hmm. and coping mechanism, both, I think. Yeah. And I actually, I, I saw a little bit of this firsthand um, last in the course of last year. I, interviewed a whole bunch of parents for a project and people say, and these are the parents with the more severe kids, if nothing else works, I'm going to go down to, to Elizabeth Fossler and, um, you know, spell to, spelling to communicate and, and we're going to try that out. So uh, I think that unfortunately that's another unaddressed issue is, you know, what can we offer people for whom nothing, you know, even 40 hours of ABA a week or whatever it is, is, is not getting you very far. What can, what else can we offer these people? Because yeah. that's part of what makes them vulnerable. Yeah. And I think that's what keeps the door open for this pseudoscientific kind of techniques to, to be available to people. Cause it does it, it, it answers an unanswerable need really in, in yeah. terms of. It's of, a miracle. Yeah. To be, to be honest with you, it is a miracle. I mean, these people have tried everything and, all of a sudden their child is communicating and not only communicating, they're like saying how much they love their mom and dad. And I mean, we cannot, the people who have been in this for a few years, they can't get out. 
I mean, let's just say it yeah. because how can you, after several years of communicating with your child and, and learning all about your child, find out that, no, you were not communicating with your child. You were communicating with the facilitator's idea of who your child is. And that might be you. Yeah. Yeah. The best thing we can do is try to nip it in the bud and keep it from being taught in universities, definitely. And if we can keep it from being introduced into, um, for new, new parents, new, yeah. new students, and that's uh, the best way to do that is to continue doing what we're, what we are doing is shining a light on it, explaining yeah. it and calling it out when we see it. And, yeah. and the more we do that, the less it's going to be comfortable for them to use. And I think yeah. that the Wikipedia pages we've yes. written on this have definitely really harmed it. I think a lot because you can't Google it or you can't not, you can't use the procedure at a certain point and say, I didn't know. <laughs> I mean, how could you not know? I mean, yeah. um, and I think that it's going to be a period of time, but anybody who's currently using it now, who's, who's, who's invested in it, I don't think that's going to change. So that's not our target audience, obviously. Yeah. I almost always have a student, at least one student who was, who's read Carly's voice. Um, so that's a, a, a work that was, uh, produced Carly Fleischman. So it's, it's a little unclear what's going on in her case, but if you look at videos of her independently typing, it's, it's fairly slow and minimal and there's always someone sitting there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then there's a whole, a whole lot of very literate texts that have been attributed to her and this book was sort of co-authored by her. But then more importantly, she also talks about this whole locked inside, it's all sensory motor model of autism. So I've got students who take my autism classes who have read that book and think that that's what autism is. Oh. Yeah. So they've read that book even in a previous autism class. So this book has made its way into some of the intro psych or autism classes that people are taking before they get to me. That's another issue, you know, uh, and, and the book, you know, if you didn't know any better, it seems like a, an interesting book. You're getting a window into what it's like to be a nonverbal autistic person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there, there, people are writing academic articles too, you know, using, using FC or RPM um, and being um, attri attributed to the person with, with autism. Yeah. So, so that's getting into the academic literature as well. And, and it's concerning because there, so far, as far as I know, there haven't been any tests that show if two people are typing that you can actually tell authorship of one or the other without the double blind testing. Yeah. Which isn't, that's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So um, one thing I noticed about when we, we've been watching videos, um, Susan and I have about people um, using FC or RPM, either one. And it seems like um, there's a lot of times where the person with disabilities is, is sort of zoning out and and um, so that raises concerns. And Catherine, you and I have kind of talked about this beforehand about language acquisition. Um, and so I'm wondering if we can kind of talk a little bit about that. And, and um, that's, that's why I have my little teddy bear here, partly. We're gonna um, teach him to speak. I, I, I was out <laughs> in the yard and I found this little critter. <laughs> and like, I didn't know what it was. I mean, it was probably very few times that an adult kind of comes across something that they don't necessarily know what, I don't have a name for this thing. I, I Googled it, right? So it's a rug rat. Um, it, um, it's a, a toy that was made in the 19, in 1998. So, but it got me thinking about what's the process really? Like if I didn't, I, I bypassed what happened internally in terms of learning a word. And so we, we thought using a teddy bear would be, would be more appropriate because most little um, kids are taught what a teddy bear is. And, and so there's a, I think there's a, there's steps that, that, people um, take internally to learn language and then um, to, to bring it around to what we're talking about, there, there are things with um, autism that um, are obstacles in terms of learning 
language in a typical way. So they, so they, they do think people do think differently and they do need different approaches yeah. um, than a typically developing child. So this is, it's partly um, why I like doing these talks. Catherine got in touch with me after we talked last time and I had brought up a little bit about um, Steven Pinker's book, The Language Instinct. And I threw out a little like theory of what I thought was happening. She's like, well, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I love this because um, uh, in, in my process as a facilitator trying to learn what really happened about FC, I've gotten to speak to people who actually do have pieces of the puzzle that I don't I don't have and I wasn't taught in the in the workshop so mm -hmm. that's where that's um, partly why I was so happy that you're able to come talk to us today so I'll throw it over to you okay yeah sure so I think you know Pinker is his book is really all about typical people right it's it's not about so it sort of assumes that various things are in place that for example you're, that you're not deaf right um, it, it assumes that you have the basic faculty is tuned in to the world around you so that you can pick up your language, your native language, and that does happen in the, when, when all those conditions are met. Now, if you imagined that a, a, you know, a deaf child, for example, and surrounded by spoken language, that child is not gonna be picking up that language even though they theoretically have the capacity to. And once the parents figure out the child is deaf, then, you know, then there's a, there are uh, you know, various adjustments made, typically sign language, <clears throat> and the child's language delay, but they hopefully catch up. Um, in the case of autism, <coughs> excuse me, what gets in the way is, um, uh, it, it's not that you are, you know, literally deaf to the speech around you, but there's, for one thing, a tendency to not orient to the speech. <clears throat> so right, right now, <coughs> excuse me, right now I'm in a room that I can hear wind outside, I can hear pending thunder, um, I can, there's all, there are trolleys going by, there are birds, there's all this noise, but for me, when one or the other of you is talking, you are the most salient thing in the world. You, your voice is the most salient sound for me, even though maybe it isn't any louder than some of these other noises I'm talking about. So I am programmed to be tuned in to your voices. What people have found with autistic, very young infants, is that there seems to be, even at that point in development, a tendency not to preferentially orient or tune in to speech sounds. So that's already going oh, to be interesting. Involved. Yeah. Mm. So imagine if you go to another country and you know you want to pick up that language through immersion, which is theoretically possible even for people as old as we are. And you just go oh, to that country. Theoretically, I mean, you might take a long time, but you you, know, you try to live with a family and you try to just you know socialize as much as you can. And, but, but if you're not, if you put on earplugs and maybe your earplugs or, or you put on headphones that make a loud staticky sound so you can't really hear people, you're not going to pick it up even though you're surrounded by it. And even if you're five years old and really could pick up a language quite easily through immersion. Um, so that's one piece of the puzzle. And another one is <clears throat> that, and this is where the teddy bear comes in, you know, for me to learn the word teddy bear. So Janice might say, hey, you know, hold it up. It's a teddy bear. But if I'm not, and I'm looking over here and I'm like watching the birds or listening to the trolleys, I'm not going to take that in at all. And I'm going to like, even no matter how many times you say, hey, look, 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 it's a teddy bear, it's a teddy bear. I'm not going to pick that up. And, you know, someone who is an advocate for FC is also going to tend to say, well, but she's picking this stuff up. You don't have to be paying attention to pick this stuff up. And autistic kids often aren't looking like they're paying attention, but they really are. But the fact of the matter is, I can't make that physical, I have to look at the teddy bear in order to make the connection between what that sound means and what, the, what it refers to. And if I'm looking away, there's no way I can do that, even if theoretically I, I wanna know what, it, what that is, right? Mm. So that's, that's the real problem. So with autism, you have, it's a, it's a spectrum. And so you have a spectrum of, you know, these, tuning in behaviors and their kids who hardly ever tune in this way and their kids who actually tune in quite a bit, those tend to be at the very mild Asperger end of the spectrum. But for what for nonverbal kids, part of what seems to be going on is that there is very little tuning into faces and voices and looking at what Janice is looking at when she's looking at the teddy bear and following her eye gaze over to the teddy bear and, and understanding that Janice is intentionally communicating 
something to me, to, you know, as part of a social interaction. So that's the missing ingredient for basic, for getting jump started into language. Hmm. I would think that, um, <clears throat> that, or I'm wondering if there's a problem too with picking up like, like I could be really enthusiastic about this and yeah. I could think that, you know, I could give the message that this is really something that's great or yeah. I could, I likewise, if it was something that you didn't want the person to, to touch or whatever, then, then you would be giving off a different signal that this is disgusting or dangerous or yeah. whatever. And, and I'm wondering if there are, are, are those cues too missing yeah. if the person isn't understanding that this this whole this whole interaction is important in some way if they're yeah. if they're if they're attending to the the noise outside and think that's important then they're going to miss some of those other cues as well is yeah. that true yeah. yeah and also even if they are looking towards you you know because that does have happen sometimes uh there is uh a fair amount of evidence that kids on the spectrum have trouble reading facial expressions right so <laughs> One way that I would be able to tell, for example, whether you were when, you know, because when you're holding a bear and pointing stuff out about the bear, there are different things you could be intending to refer to. So you might be intending to refer to the bear as an object, or you might be intending to refer to some characteristic of the bear, like it's oh soft or, you know, whatever. And there are different gestures and tones of voice you might use, or if the bear is really yucky because it was, you know, it was covered with yucky stuff that your facial expression would get that across. And that would help me figure out whether when you say yucky, yucky means bear, or whether you say, you say yucky, yucky means something that's on the bear. Oh, example. interesting. Yeah. 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 So there's like little fine tuning that happens. Yeah. Over, yeah. Are you familiar with the autism memoir, The Siege? It came out in 1967. It's by Clara Claiborne Park. Jesse Park is an artist. Um, I, I can share information on that. It's, I think it's still the best parent memoir. It's written in 1967. I got to meet them way back when. But she has a great passage teaching her daughter language. She had to be very, very deliberate about it. This is before they learned anything about ABA. And so she goes through a Dick and Jane book and she's trying to get her daughter, so her daughter relatively quickly because she'll position her and only point and say something when her daughter's attention is on it. Okay, so that's, that's kind of like what you do about joint attention is you wait for the child to be looking and then you, then you do the labeling. So she's doing this with uh, Dick and Jane and Jesse catches on and then she starts doing it with, she's trying to teach her, I think it's the word paint because Dick is painting. So she says paint, 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 but Jesse thinks she means green because it's green paint. Oh. So uh, it's like what Jesse was really interested in was color. And that shows in her art that she does. She's an artist. But uh, so her attention wasn't, she wasn't getting in, out of her head into her mother's head to sort out, you know, what her mother was probably, she wasn't doing that social reasoning to figure out what her mother might be trying to communicate. Interesting. So there are amazing. a lot of It's amazing that you can, can communicate at all. I mean, you think about this, yes. it sounds so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> pronouns are pronouns are really hard to understand how people pick up like how do I figure out that I versus you how do I figure that out because every time you refer to me you say you every time I refer to you know it's like so it, it's it these are very complex sometimes and they often involve a social embodiment of you know really uh being socially present and aware and able to take on different perspectives so with with FC and RPM, the the facilitator is often sitting beside the person with disabilities, so they're not they're not even in a position where they can actually look at each other, and the the facilitator's attention is on the board, whether it's on the on a table or or held in the air, and the the the. It seems like the activity that's being reinforced the most is the pointing part and not necessarily yeah. the words that are, well, we've seen people who can point to letters and, and say the letter. So there's you yeah. know, some of these videos. And so, so there's evidence that they're understanding the letter, but it's the facilitator who's saying, you know, B E A R. And then the facilitator says bear. And yeah. you know, or 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 fills in the sent or says the whole sentence. So, 
I'm wondering if, like, I, I don't know with facilitated communication, how that joint attention could actually work with that technique. Uh, it doesn't seem, it seems like that's a piece that might be missing. Yeah, well, I think that the argument in the case of FC might be, it's not a teaching method, the kids already know these words. But then of course the question is, how did they learn these words in the first place? Rapid prompting purports to also be a teaching methodology. Okay. And so you see some of these videos where, you know, Soma or someone comes in and is sort of combination of teaching and eliciting answers to questions. But there's still, in every video that I've seen, uh, an assumption that the child has a certain vocabulary. And of course, they're, they're producing those vocabulary words. The question is, how did they get to that point where they had picked up all these words? And, you know, I, I've read some of these purportedly autobiographical accounts, right? You know, the, the, where the circular reasoning comes in because it's the person <laughs> who's mm -hmm. being facilitated generating the information. But the, the, the claim is that they just soaked it in. You know, they watched Sesame Street. Uh, they looked at the newspaper. The radio was going, you know. <laughs> and, and so somehow overhearing this stuff and seeing stuff in print was enough for them to learn about the world, but that's not really how language works. You have to have a groundedness in relating to it early on in life to someone communicating to you where you have to look at what they're looking at. And that, I mean, that's how you pick, how else do you learn what a word means if it's not by seeing what people mean when they use it? You know, how else do you learn what a, a word means if you don't see its use being modeled by an, a flesh and blood person in the same room with you, you know, initially, uh, and, and follow what they're doing and look at their eyes and look over at what they're paying attention to, you know, following their attention. Mm -hmm. So that question is never addressed. Now, a lot of people don't spend much time, nearly as much time you know, as a linguist would thinking about those things. But, you know, I'm always like, well, how did this kid learn the word oblivious? You know, he, he typed that. Well, that's a word you learn by reading a lot. And how do you learn to read? You learn to read after you have a basic, basic vocabulary. How do you get the basic vocabulary? Well, ultimately, it all goes back to those initial moments with caregivers where you're paying attention to what they're paying attention to. We must have to have some way to know that those speech sounds, you know, they're just sounds. Otherwise, you know, they're, and until you understand that those are words that are coming out of that person's mouth, they're just sounds yeah. like the wind or the, or the yeah. train going by. You have to learn somehow that that those those sounds have some sort of meaning. That's where that preferential orienting to speech sound is sort of so fundamental. So so a typical child doesn't have to learn that. They they just know this is important to pay attention to, and faces are important to pay attention to. Hmm. So there's this built-in sense of social stimuli: voices, faces, eyes, gestures, and all that is diminished in in autism, depending on the severity. Okay. And that's known from experiments. So it's not just people aren't just making that up. They, they, they really have observed that stuff, those deficits. I'm really, I'm really curious about Helen Keller and of course the story we've heard a million times about her in water. How, yeah. how does that play into this where she was not able to see facial expression? She was not able yeah. to hear. So. Yeah. so in her case, it, it made a huge difference that she actually, I think, was 18 months old when she lost, when she had the scarlet fever and lost mm -hmm. the hearing and, and the um, and and the vision. So she already had had a foundation of language, and that makes an enormous difference because by the time you're 18 months old, you really do have a pretty, very, you know, pretty solid basis in vocabulary. You don't yet have syntax, but you have a, a pretty large set of words, even larger comprehension. And I forget how long it was between the time that that happened in around 18 months and when Annie Sullivan comes along. Uh, but I think that, I, I believe that in her autobiographies, that she, she, there is some sense that, that it was coming back. So the sense, so she had the concept of communication. Of course, then it becomes a completely different modality where she's feeling the hands moving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a feeling of the sign language that, that she learns to interpret as language. But I think it's very important that, that she had gotten the concept of language and and that was an active part of her life for that long um, and it would have been a very different story if she had been born blind and deaf hmm. now there are people who are born blind and deaf who who do learn you know and, and I, i'd like to learn more about that i actually have spent a certain amount of time 
looking for articles on how joint attention works in blindness because you know you can't follow someone's eye gaze if you're completely blind mm -hmm. and, and there's there have been people who've tried to explain it but it, you know it tends to be tactile uh and um acoustic and mm -hmm. so on but yeah if you're deaf and blind it, it gets a little harder to understand how that works um, so can you explain a little bit about the difference between language and literacy? I think I think that there's some issues with the FC people in terms of, you know, confusing those two concepts. Yeah, and actually they're not the only people who confuse those two. So there's a whole group of people who think that whole language is the way to teach reading and they're actually kind of in league with FC in terms of, so, so one big difference between language and, and literacy is, you know, language is oral or sign. So there's always been sign languages around in the world and oral language. And literacy is based on writing systems. And writing systems have only been around for a few thousand years, right? That, that, whereas languages have been around, sign and spoken languages have been, have been around for, you know, tens and of thousands, many tens of thousands of years, right? Um, so there's a huge, so, so writing systems are artificial. They don't come with being human. And, and there are cultures that are non-literate now and, 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 you know, in the past. And, and the invention, and, and, and even just inventing writing took quite a lot of, of intu intuition, insight, creativity, uh, thinking outside the box. And it's possible that alphabetic writing was invented only once ever and then spread, you know, by the Phoenicians or whatever, and then spread. Oh, cool. <laughs> so it, it's really quite, uh, it's a whole series of things. And, you know, it starts out with pictures, recording, you know, like counting, like recording sheep or, you know, grain and that kind of thing and pictures. And then it, gradually there, there are efficiencies and people start using like if, you know, the hieroglyphic for sheep has a certain sound, you might use that sound like kind of like a rebus to make mm -hmm. other words. So the, there are theories about that. But the point is that, that language is very, I mean, that writing systems are artificial. When you learn to read, your brain is actually rewired so that you are, you know, when you first see letters, you think of them as shapes, the same way you think about anything else as a shape. And then, then your, your linguistic side of your brain starts taking over once you start learning that they're, they're actually linguistic symbols. But there's a rewiring that occurs, you know, it's, it's, it's a very unnatural process. Hmm. And then, um, you know, as far as learning to read an alphabetic language goes, there's a range in how well, readily kids pick it up. And there seem to be maybe 40% of kids who with minimal instruction will figure out how to read, but there are a whole bunch of kids who need a much more intense instruction. And we're kind of in a reading crisis in this country right now because people are very resistant to teaching intensive phonics, which is really what you need. So most kids need intensive phonics, lots of practice, lots of systematicity, lots of feedback. And so what's phon phonics for people who don't know what phonics oh, sure. So phonics is like, you know, b, b goes b, d goes d. You start with very simple words, you, you know, b, ad, d, bad. Um, and, you, and, and you might start with very simple short vowels and very regular spellings and one syllable words. And you, you know, that's where the, you know, simple books like Dick and Jane, not, not actually not really necessarily Dick and Jane, but these were books with very simple, like the Dr. Seuss, the cat in the hat, right? So those are books that reinforce uh, very uh, simple sound patterns where you learn first, you learn the alphabet, you learn the sounds the letters typically make, and then you uh, learn what happens when you put them together. Hmm. And, uh, and that's, so that's how you learn to break the code. And so then, so then as far as reading goes, that's, that's a very important element, you know, learning the code, um, how to basically translate written symbols into spoken sound. But obviously, then you also need to comprehend the sound. So that's where you need to be a good reader. You need to have both good language and good decoding skills. So the challenge with FC is that already there's a question about how these kids learn language because of uh, how much joint attention behavior are these kids showing, the kids who use FC. Uh, but then there's also the question of how they learn to read and write. And by their own accounts, and again, it's the circular reasoning, but by someone's account, the, these, these kids have been ghettoized special ed classes and they didn't, weren't taught anything. And, and so, but to learn how to read, you need to be in a, in a regular first grade class and you need to have a teacher that walks you through all the sounds of English in a systematic way. So how do these kids, if they didn't have that typical education, how did they learn how to read and write? So some people say, well, 
they're hyperlexic. So hyperlexic, what does that mean? That means that the child can, uh, has an early interest in letters. And actually my son had an early interest in letters. And he, um, by the way, said, let me know if you can't hear me because it's raining really, really hard right now. <laughs> um, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, um, he was spelling letters, he was spelling words out of Plato at a really young age, but he didn't understand what they meant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can be really interested in letters from a young age and to some extent crack the code ahead of being able to understand anything. So hyperlexia doesn't explain FC because these kids, if these messages are meaningful, the kids have to understand them. And hyperlexia is not about understanding. It's simply about the decoding end of things. It, you know, set letters to sounds, but you have to also have to learn the sound, what those mean. So, it, you know, it, it, there are a whole bunch of unanswered questions. Now what Douglas Bicklin will say is, well, you know, these kids learned to read the same way all kids learn to read by being surrounded by a print rich environment. Mm -hmm. But that isn't how kids learn to read. They learn, they're taught explicitly or they teach themselves explicitly. And Bickman was the man who brought uh, facilitated communication to America. He learned it from Rosemary Cosley Cos Cos from Australia yeah. and brought it over. And he is now um, has an institution at uh, Syracuse University in New York. And it is well funded and it is still turning out. Um, it's mostly the same group of people that are yeah. that are the uh, it's this little insular world of people who who I think should know better, but uh, are perpetuating There's a the lot of money cycle. involved, I think. I think yeah. Money involved. So so the money that's involved is it's not just that people feel good about oh we're we're helping out this this these locked in kids who would have no other way of communicating, but I think a lot of the money is coming from parents who are uh, who have children who are being who are using facilitated communication is that right I, well I gather that, that there are two huge funding sources for FC and in both cases these are super wealthy families that have an individual with autism in the family so it's like you know millions of dollars times emotional commitment <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's basically what's going on. And one thing I've noticed is that, you know, some of these foundations will fund other things as well. They'll fund other autism researchers and so on and so forth that aren't directly involved in FC. And I've noticed that some of those researchers kind of like don't really want to talk about FC. They don't want to criticize it. Are these uh, researchers in autism or are they yeah, on the Yeah, they might be doing like, they might be neurologists or, or something else, but they don't want to criticize their funders. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, people say, what's a harm in somebody, you know, we hear that all the time. And Janice and I are going to do a, a video on the harm of facilitated oh, communication here yeah. sometime soon. It's going to yeah. be really horrible to yeah. uh, get the details. But I think it's one of these things. It's like, so what's the harm? You know, so a kid gets a college degree and he didn't really actually go to college, but his facilitator was the one who was doing all the work. So a kid is, you know, writing poetry and publishing books. You know, what's the harm? I could see them saying these kinds of things and yeah. and they don't really understand. And if you look at the Wikipedia page, anybody who's interested, it has uh, quite a few um, examples of the harm. You know, one thing I've wondered about, and I, I don't, I, I'm just asking this as a question. I, I'm not making any accusations, but I, I have wondered whether it's possible that you know, just watching some of these videos where the kids are really, really calm, very eerily calm. Is it possible that some of them are under have undergone some sort of sedation in the process? I, my I don't son know. would never even my son would never even stand for that. Like, <laughs> but they're so yeah. calm. And well, I, I think it's I think that it is. That's a really good point. But I think what it is is they they understand this is this is their world now, and they're not going to get to do the thing that they really want to do until yeah. they sit down and hit and have somebody hold their hand and they. They yeah. extend their finger because you'll see how they extend their finger right away, you know. Yeah. And it's like yeah. they've been trained. Okay. Yeah. We sit down in my chair. The person is very close to me. They put their hand in a certain position on yeah. my back. They hold yeah. my hand in a certain position. I put my finger out. Yeah. I sit and do this. And then I get cookies afterwards or something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I think it yeah. feels like, I think. I think there's two types of responses to FC. Um, 
I think there's a passivity in some of the, the individual, the students um, that I think in a way they may be thinking this is easier for me than actually attending and speaking and or doing sign language or whatever. So I wonder if that's a component. And then there's another, there's another set of people that I've seen that push and pull and tug and get up and, and are really resisting. There's actually a study that I love with the, the, um, the, the student was using FC and um, changed, changed teachers and the second teacher didn't use FC, they used a picture exchange system. But the mom, uh, the, you know, the, the mom was saying, well, how come he's not, I think it was a he, how, how come he's not um, producing academically like he did last year? So they ended up doing a second test, but what he was doing with the FC was, that's when they were using typewriters. He'd pull the paper out of the typewriter and say, no FC, <laughs> which is, it's documented. Wow. He, when they did the double blind testing, he got every single, every single item right with picture exchange system. And he didn't, and all the FC um, the interactions were based on what the facilitator saw. So they, they proved that he could have independent um, communication using a picture exchange system. Which what is, is that? I've not heard of picture exchange system. What does that mean? Um, well, it's it's sort of like uh, if I have a um, a picture of a, a cookie or something, I give it to you, and that's what I want. I want a cookie, you know, and I'm giving you that that oh. picture. So you get to pick, you know, like a, there's a, a I want to put on my coat. So you pick up a picture of a coat. It's an early kind of a uh, I, and I, I didn't really use it, but um, it's a it's a way to get people to pick and choose what it is that they want, you know, or, you know, they it's a it's a early a, another form of a language. My, um, my son actually used a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah. And, and, and I mean, potentially it can get you pretty far because eventually you can there's a Velcro board and you can put the word, you can put more than one word on it and in a certain order. And the pictures often have written words on them also so that you can gradually learn that. So I think, it, you know, potentially it's promising. The mother didn't see that that was working. I don't, I don't know what happened. They didn't, yeah. they didn't, um, they, that wasn't, they didn't go any farther with yeah. except for showing that FC didn't work. So I don't know what I don't know what happened to yeah. the to the individual, but that was one of my favorite. Like he actually chose FC. So so to get back to whether they're they're drugged or they're passive or whatever, or they're just trained to to participate. I'm not sure. I I do see also there's a in between the typing with a lot of the students they'll touch the usually their mom's face or whatever yeah. so that's the kind of interaction that i think is really actually real and yeah. there's sort of some sort of reinforcement like am i doing this correctly and and yeah. you know the and the mom will say yeah and they'll they'll go back to typing or whatever so i don't know i think it's probably complicated why some an individual would sit passively and let that happen well we're only seeing moments in videos too we don't see anything else where they're throwing themselves to the ground or they're, you know, running around the table or anything like that. They're not going to show those, but we do, we, I really think that what's going on is that the child has learned to extend their finger and sit there and it'll be over and then they can move on to whatever they want to do. Because the mother's got other things in the, well, the facilitator a lot of times is the mom from what I understand. So, you know, she's got other things to do. The speech clinician that worked with my client after me um, said every time she got out activities that were similar to what I was doing with the person with FC, she'd put her finger out to, to type. So essentially, I taught her how to point. Oh, and, and that always <laughs> breaks my heart. You know, oh. like I, and I so I think I think it's we have to be it's like the green paint you were talking about earlier. You know, it's like we really have to be as educators really careful about what it is that we're really teaching people you know and it's and I, I i wouldn't have thought of that except having gone through that experience you know it's sort of like kind of a little bit crazy when you think about it the consequences of what we yeah. have ramifications that we're not even aware of yeah 
we should we should make sure we do a call out for anybody who's watching and we've had the same 10 to 11 people on the call on the video since we started so i assume there's at least 10 to 11 people following our conversation mm -hmm. probably doing other things in the background but if you guys have any questions please put them into the facebook chat box so i can so i can read them off to Catherine and to uh, janice please so Catherine, you were talking about ABA a little bit earlier. So can you talk about what that is and also some evidence-based kind of communication um, techniques that can be used? Yeah, sure. And actually, I don't know a ton about ABA. We did do ABA with my son and, and I actually, for similar reasons, he, he would never have sat still for it. And what does that stand for, ABA? Applied Behavioral Analysis. Okay. Um, and the versions of it that we were aware of involved uh, significant amounts of time where your child sits opposite you or someone else at a table and, and, and you go through things like sorting colors and learning, you're learning categories, you're learning uh, basic words and categories at first and then you try to build on that. And it was just sort of a no go for us because our son wouldn't even sit still. So I kind of <laughs> did stuff as a linguist and said that was you know, ABA like. So I mean, the, the, the general spirit of ABA, I think applies to all sorts of accepts of successful teaching methods, you break things down into little steps, you teach explicitly, you do this when you teach arithmetic, you do this when you teach reading, you know, and, and you do this when you teach skills to people with autism. But with ABA, you're teaching stuff that, for autism, you're teaching stuff that you don't normally have to think about how to teach, right? So, you know, when you're the parent of an autistic kid, suddenly you have to teach all these things that you wouldn't have to teach to a typical child because they're not tuning into language, for example. So. So, you know, you basically for what you need to do with language is something that will bypass the joint attention issue and get the child's attention and, and get the child to focus. And so I, I started with just um, sitting behind my son and reaching around and writing stuff out for him on a piece of paper because he was very interested in letters. And we would talk about we would link the words to the sounds to the objects and, you know, write phrases out and, and you know, sometimes I would have him uh, select the right sentence, you know, this because of that or that because of this, you know, what makes sense. Um, and, but then I started developing a, um, uh, a, a, a linguistic software program where you basically, uh, you have to type in, you get a picture and a prompt about the picture and you have to type in a sentence that answers the question. And then it gives you feedback. So if you have words in the wrong order, it will tell you. If you have wrong endings, it will tell you. It, it's very, the, the way I came to see it is that for someone like my son who partially picks stuff up, but not completely, it's like teaching English as a second language, right? Where the stuff that we would, we just automatically learn the right or, word order for English. We don't have to be mm -hmm. taught that. We learn when to put ing at the end of something and when not to. And so he had to go through that through deliberate instruction. So I just had to make a, you know, ABA like step by step systematic curriculum. ABA doesn't have something like this actually. And I had gone out before that and I'd actually looked for English as a second language stuff. I was all ready to just buy a um, linguistic software like a Duolingo for English or which actually didn't exist at the time. But the problem with a lot of these things like Rosetta Stone, I don't know if you, either of you have ever tried to learn another language. It's very passive. You're not producing sentences and getting feedback on your grammar. You're kind of clicking on pictures. And so you get into that problem with autistic kids of, well, are they paying attention that Janice brought up? Of, are they paying attention to the right thing? Like, what if they're clicking on this picture because they've learned something you want them to learn? So, so that's, so that for various reasons, I went to the extreme trouble because it took a huge amount of programming to make a, an entire English language grammar curriculum with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lessons and exercises and and I put him through it and um, and he you know and he got very good at typing and um, and and then you know every once in a while he and he knew that he was the first person to use this and so he was always testing it whatever and I remember one day he said something like I am hard to do that and I said no it's that is hard for you to do not I am hard to do that and then I created a lesson and then the next day he gets oh wow a lesson he's like he knew, why, he knew why I created that lesson. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that what works in autism in general, I mean, ABA does have a lot of evidence behind it. If you look at systematic reviews of <laughs> autism therapies, that, that comes out on top. But, but basically what works is you've got to get it, the child's attention directed to the right thing. 
and you need immediate feedback and you need to break things down into step-by-step -step as much as possible in, in a systematic way. And, and that, that kind of works for everybody. But for autism, that, there's that crucial step of directing attention to the right thing. So it seems like if like any minute that you're using FC or RPM is minutes wasted on actually doing things that would work and like getting the yeah. child's attention or, you know, yeah. there must be like a, a window of optimum learning that goes on. If you've, if you've passed that, that window, then you're the, I mean, it's not that you can't learn, but the ability yeah. to make, great strides if you're if you have the potential to do that yeah you know i lost I, I think there's a lot that we don't know about nonverbal kids and there's probably a quite a range in what they can do or or you know what they could do if you if they were taught but uh one of my friends katherine johnson who's um she she uh she she has worked with temple grandin on uh co-authored Animals oh, I knew that is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got she's got two autistic sons, and um, one of them has been using my program, and he's completely nonverbal. And if you were just to meet him, you would have no idea that this kid could, could go through all these lessons, and you know, type out things like the circle on the left is larger than the circle on the right, and he could do that. Um, you know, he learns step by step. He's now learning question asking, uh, but he. Uh, I think is an example of how you can't just trust what you see. You, you, you need to give opportunities to these kids to try out, you know, not just ABA, but, but other things that are ABA like that, that maybe draw their attention in, in ways that other things don't. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I do wonder about some of the FC kids that we see. Let me hang up my phone. I do wonder about whether they, um, about whether some of these kids might actually have the potential to, to you know, learn, learn a lot more than we think they can in, in that's actual learning. And techniques and things are always being developed and things are always changing for these people. I've heard, oh, we tried that at one point and it didn't work. It's, you know, come back and, and look at it again because there's a lot of things that have changed yeah. and it's, and yeah. uh, techniques. Um, I think maybe one of the things parents need to be, oh, I don't know how to put this with it sounding nice. It's just to realize that your child is who your child is and you, yeah. you may not ever have a child that's going to be able to live independently. You may not ever have a child that's going to be able to go to college and get married and have a career and to accept your child as your child yeah. is to be the best, whatever and, and best you know, means. Very, very slow progress because uh, so often there is progress, even, you know, in, in the more extreme cases, it's just very slow and people get impatient. But so to accept the progress at the rate at which it occurs, I think, is another challenge. Right. Accept the wins that you have, but it may not be. Yeah. I they may be it. tiny, but I think if you get it yourself into it and adjust your expectations, they can be very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. To be yeah. able to accept what you can. Yeah. Doesn't mean, but you see the, you know, I don't, it just gets really interesting when you see these children who are, you know, in the situation they're in, nonverbal children who have had no real instruction in reading and writing and no communication at all, really. And, you know, they're sitting down with a facilitated communicator for uh, a, a few hours, a few days, and next thing you know, they're writing poetry or they're writing yeah. these long sentences and this, it's like, well, you couldn't even do that with a with a child who was communicating. I mean, you know, who's verbal, you couldn't just sit yeah. down at a, a a five-year-old and say here's you know <laughs> and all of a sudden the child is writing sentences and things it's just where in the world does a parent not say wait a minute there is something wrong here or something really this is a red flag how could my child all of a sudden be communicating like that no yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well i think that, that there has been for ever since we've identified autism way back you know the last century that there's been this notion of a locked-in child. So I think that's something that never quite goes away. So Bruno Bettelheim, that was the locked-in child that psychoanalysis was supposed to unleash. You know, the child had turned against the world because the parents hadn't been sufficiently loving. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, with floor time, like I mentioned, we were try we, people tried to talk us into doing that. And the, the idea, again, seemed to be that our child will pick things up naturally if we just open things up for him a little bit more. Uh, so I think that, that it's very, it just never 
quite goes away, this idea of this locked in person that, you know, maybe it goes back to the belief in a soul and then people extend that into the idea of an intact intellect um, based on neuro neurotypical standards or, or whatever. But uh, I think that, that it's just maybe a lot of people are wired to believe this and it's very hard to let go. I think, I think communication too is, it's what makes us human, you know, it's sort of spoken communication. You know, I know, I know that um, cats and dogs have their own way of letting you know what they want and need and, and oftentimes it feels affectionate or whatever, but, but what makes us human is the spoken condition, you know, or ability to speak. And I think if, if you've got a child, I think if I had a child, that had difficulty speaking, then that would be that would be a hard thing to adjust to, you know. Yeah. I, you know, uh, I I just think it's that so wired into us. Um, you're not saying a child uh, we need communication to be human. You're, I mean, you're not saying that spoken language is, makes us human. You're saying communication makes us human. Well, well, sign language. Sign language. What I'm, say, what I'm saying though is that I think people can be can communicate. Um, non-verbal, this communication that yeah, happens. communication is, speak. is necessary. But I think, I think for a lot of people, the spoken language is really important. That having that conversation, having the child say, I love you, mommy, yeah. is really important. And that there's ways that that can happen without, you know, I've seen, I've seen non-verbal kids that when you come in the room, they let their face lights up and they come and muckle on to you. And, you know, that, that saying, I love you, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I don't know. I think it's the, I think that the promise of FC is that they're able to type out all these messages. And so I think that's, you know, I, that's the draw. I think it's not, it, you know, if nonverbal communication was enough, then sign language would be okay. Or, or, um, there are there are students who vocalize and you kind of get used to what they're saying you know mm -hmm. you know they're upset if they're grunting at you in a certain way you mm -hmm. know it doesn't have to be spoken but i think that's the promise of facilitated communication is that they'll be able to write that poetry they'll be able to write that you know the play or um you know have that interaction and i'm, I'm wondering if that that's really that to me, when I look at it, is really the key piece. It's like all of a sudden, and you taught, you convince yourself that that this person is finally able to say what's inside them. And so, even though you know, when Betsy hit me in the face, that was communication. That was very clear communication. But it wasn't. She didn't say to me, you know, get out of my space, or I'm going to hit you. You know, and th that's the difference. I think. I think the promise of FC is that spoken that spoken interaction. Even every, though, but, you know, go ahead. Oh, I was just say every parent wants to be able to relate to their kid. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think the other challenge with autism is it's the combination of the lim limited language, we, which we also saw, and also the lack of eye contact. And, and so you desperately are looking for some way to relate to your kid to be able for you to tell them that you love them too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, or to, to let them know ahead of time about a change that's going to upset them. Uh, you know, whatever it is, we, you know, we, we, the very fundamental urge of the mother is to be able to communicate to her children and, and, and that autism disrupts that massively. Um, with sign language, you, I mean, with deafness, you, you learn sign language and, and that's not as, it's a different route and it's hard, but it's a, you can get there. But with, with autism, it's, it's just, it, it really um, challenges some of the fundamental uh, desires and reasons of being a parent, right? Yeah. yeah. How, how big do we think a uh, facilitated communication RPM actually is in, in, a, in a, you know, for that we're seeing? I mean, it seems like it's a big deal because I, you know, Janice and I talk about it all the time <laughs> and we've got a whole group of people that we're communicating about it and we're writing about it and reading all this stuff about it. So it feels like it's happening constantly, but do we know? Well, I would say that when I was interviewing parents for this project, I, it was a, more or less a random sample of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, certainly wasn't selected on the basis of, you know, communication method or whatever. And, um, and, and I would say that actually I was kind of alarmed by the percentage of parents of, with extreme kids who uh, were, were con seriously considering FC. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that, that was a sort of random ish sample and it seemed kind of high there. Uh, yeah. I just know that there's a place in my backyard that, that does this. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, a, it's like a satellite for Elizabeth Fossler's um, clinic in, in Virginia that is in the suburbs of Pennsylvania. Hmm. Uh, I think it's only there, but uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah so I, think there's, I think there's pockets. I know people in um, Vermont are getting, I've heard back, Vermont's really funny. We've been we've been trying to get uh, administrators in Vermont to to speak out against it, and they'll tell you stuff behind the scenes, but they will not go public. They will not go public. What but is I've had a couple exchanges with some um, people in the school systems that say they're getting pressure to use FC again in in the schools. Um, it's like a renewed effort to to. So I think that's. There's certain pockets, California, um, University of Northern Iowa. So there's a there's a, a, a population around there. Um, uh, I'm not sure where Cal Lutheran is, but that they teach RPM in their school. Um, We're in California. So, say that again. We're in California. Uh, I can't, I'm not coming up with the name of the the school at the moment. I think I remember you telling me before it didn't. Yeah. California's huge, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't think, I can't think of the name of the, the school. I've got it written somewhere, but um, I know that if you follow where, uh, Syracuse University has a list of master trainers. And so if you follow, if you follow some of them, you can kind of see where the hot spots are. Um, if they haven't gone underground, they, or or if they're not like as, associated with Syracuse, then it's a little bit harder. University of Virginia, um, oh, yeah. now, so yeah. Is Why Maine still teaching? Were, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I was just curious, Janice, when you said people are in Vermont are afraid to speak out publicly. What do you have a sense of what they're afraid of? Well, I I um, FC is supported at the state level. Yeah. And so I think there's funding issues and there's there's um there's there's administrative support so um they're not they're not willing to the higher ups aren't willing to ban it um and the people that are frustrated with it lower down on the in the, on the totem pole um can only go so far in terms of agitating or they get they get pressure to to keep things status quo so it's 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 um I I know a couple people there personally and they it's it's not easy for for them to be in that situation. They're using in Vermont they're using FC in their um, designated agencies. So they're they're in some of them not all of them but in some of them they're using FC in counseling sessions and stuff. So I, I think that's a that's a, a disaster waiting to happen. I think if they're if they're using FC, you know, unchecked FC to um, to do counseling sessions, I think that's not a really good idea, personally. Janice, didn't we have uh, one of our new GSOW editors, Kelly? She was saying that she she had never heard of facilitated communication before, and she works in the school school district, I think, in the music area. I think what was she saying? She said she read about facilitated communication, one of her lessons to become a better, to be a Wikipedia editor with us. And she said, oh, this seems really familiar. I think they're doing something like this in our school. And she says, and everybody kind of knows that the parent is actually the one doing the communicating, but we just kind of ignore it. it what no. was she talking about with that? Do you remember? Uh, I don't, I don't remember that. I mean, I, I get so many emails. I, I get people, unless I have a really in-depth interaction with people, I get people's stories kind of. Yeah, I think it head. might have been a Facebook comment. She just kind of, I think she was watching one of our talks last, last time okay. we talked. I think yeah. that was part of her comment. She said that she, they don't call it that and it's not exactly facilitated communication, but it, she the can see how it's very similar to this same idea. And the parent will say, well, he wants that, and it's it, the child didn't say he wanted it, but the parent knows he wants it. Yeah, they're putting their words into the child's mouth, and it's like by proxy, you know, communication yeah. by proxy, which I guess is facilitated communication. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they call it supported typing. They don't they don't call it FC. So if you don't know that FC has ten different names, 
Yeah, so I wonder about that. Gonna <laughs> my, I got a funny story. My brother teaches in, uh, he's a psychologist teacher in, in uh, Vermont. And he had, <laughs> he had one of his students come up and ask if he knew Giannis Boynton because his, his last name's the same as mine. And they were pro FC. And he's like, yeah, I, I know her. He's my brother, right? I know her, and I don't believe in FC, but <laughs> here's some information. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh-oh, so I, I hear from, I hear from um, people on university staffs that, that can speak out to a certain degree, but if they, if they actually start pushing for change, then they're told to to stop rocking the boat because the uh, the FC people are donors and they don't want to they don't want to um, upset donors at universities and so I mean there's there's pressure there's still pressure not to speak out and mm -hmm. the 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 thing that gets me about that is that I know as like a as as a personal experience and I think observing how facilitators move through the world. Um, if somebody doesn't say anything, you take that as a yes. Like if somebody's if if somebody says no, that you know I have a problem with FC and it's not evidence based, you you write them off. You know you don't know what you're talking about. But if somebody, uh, you're a staff member or whatever, doesn't confront you, but doesn't, you know they they don't come out directly and say no, then. The facilitator takes that as a yes, but the the person that's not speaking up doesn't want to call out their colleague. Silence is so, consent. Yeah. So so that's there's a we we need to I think we we need to support critics, um, mm -hmm. you know, and people that are evidence based um, practitioners. We need to support them better. We need to have policies in place already. Like it, it, the problems often come when somebody moves into the district that wants to use FC or RPM, um, you know, unless they're unless they they're already got it in in their schools. Like in some of some of the Vermont schools and some of the New York schools have F, they're practicing FC. But I think I think we need to do a better job as a as a group to get these guidelines in place before you know for evidence based um, techniques and testing. Um, protocols bef before these issues come up, you know, because once once you're confronted that or like Oberlin College, I can I can bet. I mean, I don't know much about their procedure. They allowed um, somebody quite prominent to go through their school with FC and graduate, and um, I can almost bet that they didn't have a protocol in place. So when the when when the parents show up and say we want our child to go through this, they're not gonna. You're, you're kind of put between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. You know, if you you don't want to look like you're discriminating. No, if you, yeah, if you say no, we're not gonna allow that. Then you're gonna you're gonna have a lawsuit on your hands. So mm -hmm. I think it's I think there are some. Just as just as there's there's psychological issues in place for people who are using F psychological and social um, challenges for people who um, are crit are critics and and you know they either can't or won't speak out when when the time when push comes to shove. One thing I've wondered about is if you're a professor at Oberlin, for example, and you happen to know that that it's been debunked uh, and then you have a student in the, in your class and there's a plagiarism policy at the school right <laughs> and he is handing in a paper i mean would i what would happen if i said look i i can't accept this until i know that the method that you're using that, that we can get you a few message <laughs> that's <test>. clever <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. i bet no one like would, that. I, mean, I, I would love to hear some off the record off the record comments from oberlin faculty about what they went through recently that's the way yeah. of getting around it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I know the the Lakeview Community College um, used to have a policy on their website against um, the use of FC, and their reasoning was we can't tell who's doing the schoolwork. But yeah. um, I talked about that at SciCon in my video, and since then, and I don't know, I don't know if there's a direct cause and effect, but since then they've removed the policy. 
Oh. So I don't know if they had a policy change or somebody got to them or, or what happened, but that policy is no longer on their website. So I thought that was kind of interesting. <clears throat> and yet a lot of call, I mean, I think most colleges have plagiarism policies and you know, and plagiarism is passing off someone else's work as your own. Now it gets complicated. What, who's the, in, who's intentionally passing off what as what, right? right. But you know, if the student in my class, you know, it just, that's just an angle that there would be, it would be interesting to see if anyone's tried that. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, we should, we should come to an end here. We're almost to two hours and it flew by like that. Yeah, it <laughs> As it does. These conversations are so fascinating. Is there anything else that we want to make sure that we add in to this talk? And I know that we're going to be doing more conversations. Janice and I want to talk about the eye gazing, um, what is it called when the there's a letter board in the air and the child is supposedly looking at the letters at a distance and somebody's is that eye gazing yeah that's eye gazing that's that, one form and then there's another form that uses a um a computer or a computerized uh like a band on their head that has a has a uh, a light on it that detects the letters <clears throat> yeah and then we've got to get to this harm stuff oh my gosh yeah. we always every time we're talking we go we got to get to the harm stuff <laughs> it's incredible the stuff that happens it's funny when we first started the uh, susan and i have been talking about fc for quite a few years and when we first started this we were like it's kind of low-hanging fruit and stuff but then you get into it and it's like it isn't at all it's really complicated yeah it reaches so many aspects i mean i'm very interested in the world of the psychics and this is just like uh, automatic writing or you know contacting a psychic and the psychic says oh well the medium uh, the medium is saying this and they're saying well, the person I'm in contact with is saying that i want you to leave your your all your money to the psychic you know and you're like well, who's saying this, the psychic or the person I'm channeling? Well, no, the psychic is is not even aware of what's being happening, you know. And it's, just, I mean, that's that's a, an extreme end. But I'm very interested in this idea of of uh, messages coming from somewhere, and it's being attributed to somebody, but it's actually somebody else. There's somebody with another motive. But Janice and I've been doing this for so long, talking about it, and it started. True Voices really started because I. Uh, Janice kept telling me that she was on an email group with a bunch of academics <laughs> and I said how long have you been on this email group and she goes oh years we're going to do something someday and it's like well done with that <laughs> you know <laughs> you've met the person who says forget that let's do something and we we put together the true voices project and and uh, I tell Janice all the time the the end of FC started the day Janice and I met <laughs> <laughs> It just hasn't happened yet, but it's we're on a mission. We're on a mission, and it is getting there. And I said the first thing we got to make sure is done is those Wikipedia pages have to be written so that people who, as they learn about facilitated communication, will go to those Wikipedia pages and learn more. I gave a I gave a talk in Portsmouth, I think it was Portsmouth, England, uh, last year. Gosh, it feels time is just crazy right now but I think it was last April and after the talk a couple women came up and they said I've been reading all the stuff that you've been doing about facilitated communication I'm really interested in that because it's you know they're they're in the education world and they've had people try to use it and stuff and and I, I think we said something about the GSOW project wrote the Wikipedia page and one woman said I've probably read that page you know a hundred times you know looking for it for using it for information to, to be able to use for something else that she was trying to do. It's like a one-stop shop where people can get good information about it. Yeah. What I've seen, um, I've been involved with this for longer than, you know, since the early nineties. And what I've been seeing is that, and what's great is that people are now able to talk to each other. So the psychologists are yeah. talking to each other, the linguists are talking to each other, the, the, you know, the, uh, the, educators the speech language pathologists are all like that information is now being shared in a way that wasn't before so people were fighting fc because one of one of the questions i had is why weren't people speaking out you know and and they were but they were in twos and threes you know they mm -hmm. were a couple in australia there's a couple in the uk there's a few in the united states but now 
hopefully with the internet and, yeah, we, and we're able to be a part of that, but also this kind of conversation too is 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 really helpful. and yeah and you know how yeah. academics are <laughs> i could say that because i'm talking to, but they, they <laughs> tend to want to write a journal article about it we're gonna do something we're gonna write well, that's a book. The, but that's the way article. their system that's the way the academic yeah, but it doesn't, works. this is a different world we're in right now we're in this world of social media and emotion and and impulse and you know desperate parents and we got to get you know it's a whole different world out there and the way to communicating people aren't going to read an academic paper or a book necessarily you know so that's just the way world we're in right now so well, we, have a, we, need those, we need those pieces. It's a, it's well, of sort course, of say, but they've been but written. It's been discussed 30 years ago, you know. <laughs> how many more, how many articles? I want more articles responding to things that as we learn new things, but to go back and rewrite the history, uh, to rewrite what we already know. Well, the, the problem with that is that the, the new crop of FC and RPM promoters are saying, well, that stuff is old. We've changed. <laughs> And yet they won't. Let, they won't undergo studies. They they won't. Oh no, study, we can't so. challenge somebody. No, that would be right. that would be demoralizing right. to their to their poor student. That if they were challenged, that right. would be like saying you're not really speaking. So yeah. we can't do that because it would just set yeah, them yeah. back a year. They yeah. don't. They changed the rules because because part in part because of me, right? Because yeah. I'm, I'm the black <laughs> facilitator, and but they they. They haven't, first of all, they didn't include the people that had problems with their technique to, to correct the, the problems. And second of all, it hasn't changed. <laughs> the, we the have rules are the same. They're we just, have one uh, statement from David who says, thanks for doing this. He says, I've read about facilitated communication in the past, but hearing personal stories from those closely involved was great. And he's absolutely right. Because again, we're appealing to emotion. We're appealing to um we're, we're appealing to personal experiences and and when you it's you know we're not fighting back with an academic paper we're we're explaining this is how it works and i love how what we'll do is you know you take a video that they the facilitated communication world has uploaded thinking it's great and we say look at what you're looking i mean what what are you look, actually looking at these people aren't the children are not looking the basic they are not looking at the keyboard Mm -hmm. The only person who's looking at the keyboard is the facilitator and the child is looking off into another direction with their finger out. So how are they typing without looking at the keyboard and without having any grounding, you know, you know, where you put your wrist down where you can touch type, but yeah. just in the air and that basic, just the basic of that people go, Oh, I really hadn't thought about that before, you know, and we don't have to get into the academics. We don't have to get into any past that. Just let's answer that question first. How are the children typing when they can't see what they're typing? Yeah. Just yeah. that. I think it gets back to what Catherine said, was saying early on about how difficult it's becoming to, to tell with the technology, like how the communication is actually happening. And the more that we, are able to teach people what to look for you have to really start looking at facilitator yeah. behavior and how how mm -hmm. um, integral that person is to the actual communication process to to start understanding what's what's independent and what isn't independent communication so the more we can do this um, i think the better deborah warkin has said she's pushing back on me using uh talking about the academics giving them a hard time and <laughs> that's fine <laughs> deborah says it, it could be hoped that new journal articles might cause popular articles to be written i guess the media would pick up on that more people could see them and they might be more usable they'd be usable on wikipedia and absolutely if 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 uh, an academic journal is being written I mean, an academic article is being written it may interest you know i don't know uh, Rolling Stone magazine to do an article on or getting into a different genre that might not have normally have been interested in you know people magazine might write an article on it because they hear about this academic thing but I don't know I, I still kind of think that's not so likely that that an academic journal is going to per uh, push people who are um, I think the emotional stories that we tell 
the stories that we're explaining about experiences and, and, and as we do these videos, I think that's more likely to get a journalist to go, wait a minute, let me write about that. And, and then tell it as a personal, tell it in the, using emotion and telling it with the uh, compelling story that it is. Well, I think that's a general public, and then there's the, also the you have to have you have to have that groundwork of academic research to say, to say like science doesn't science works by consensus in some ways, and so those academic papers really are very important to to continuing to say look we looked at this in 1994, uh, ASHA just rewrote their their they actually strengthened their opposition policy, but they didn't just do it you know, cold, they looked at what the research was between 1994 and 2018 oh, or 20 or whatever. Uh, 2019, I think, is when they rewrote it. So they, they, they took the time to look at the evidence-based information that was out there and, again, renewed their... It, it, they gave they gave FC and RPM a chance to actually prove that it's evidence based. They didn't just say, you know, we don't believe you. They said, let's look at what you've shown us to to prove and solve these problems that we're seeing with FC and RPM. And and they failed to do that. Community failed to do that. So so I think I I think the more I'm doing this, the more I think all of those things are important. The, the research is there to, to show this is consistently evidence-based and consistently mm -hmm. this is why we believe the things that we do. And then, then you also need that extra step to get it into the popular culture. And, and that's actually, I think, one of the more difficult things because the reporters that I've worked with, and there's, there, are, there are quite a few that <laughs> I probably wouldn't work with again, um, but there are quite, there are, there's a handful that I think have done a really excellent job at, at doing an evidence-based type look at facilitated communication in the press. But the problem with them is they, they're in the business of selling articles and that only sells once in their article. Like Slate mm -hmm. Magazine did a great article yeah. in 2016. How many times did you write about it? Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And then, and so the, and, and, um, Michael Burke is another one for the, the the Daily Orange did a great oh yeah yeah Jose on on Syracuse University is the the student newspaper for the Daily uh, for Syracuse University they did a great article in 2018 but they're not going to touch it again you know it's it's sort of like that's the problem with the popular press it's to sell stories and what are the stories that are most compelling the ones that have miracles and so that's a that that is a um, a problem that we haven't really been able to solve quite you know, the 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 critical community the scientific community needs to be able to have fc so that people aren't surprised that it's still around you know, we're meeting so many people that are like oh i thought that was debunked you i know, hear it all the time so that, like we so that's a problem that needs to be solved still is is how do mm -hmm. we get this from the academic community into the popular press in a way that is consistent and visible and um, you know, really pounds the point home that this is still a thing. and It's, it's still, still a thing. Well, and it, we're just getting yeah. bombarded with all these movies and news items and so on constantly. You know, the Deej movie, the, the reason I jumped. That's a whole happened. other story, isn't it? The yeah. Deej. Yeah. Absolutely. And it does. And sometimes they don't say they're using facilitated communication. Like I said, with the, like the Apple commercials, no. they're not saying hey, we're using facilitated communication, but we know <laughs> we're looking at it going, hmm, how is that happening? Yeah, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do. But I know, Catherine, you're doing a great job. You've got your blog <laughs> posts, and you can, you can um, tell how good a job somebody's doing with facilitated communication um, with all the... I've gotten, I've, gotten blocked by, I've gotten blocked by a whole bunch of people on Twitter. Um, and actually the most shocking block, and, it's, and mostly it's been over FC, not over other things I might say that could be controversial. And for me, one of the most shocking blocks I got was um, from the Thinking Person's Guide to Autism, which is this organ that I, I don't know if either of you is familiar with, but back in the day, it was a, a whole bunch of people, parents, practitioners, um, uh, educators, and so on, who the only rule was everybody can contribute. It just has to be scientifically grounded. And that was great. And so 
we contributed and there was book. And then it got taken over by someone who got taken over by FC. And the whole organization now is, is you know, all about FC or RPM. And, and I started, when I got on Twitter a couple of years ago, I started noticing that, that, that they were posting this stuff that seemed kind of alarming to me. And so then I would repost it and make some snarky remark about, you know, it was FC. And eventually, I think there were just two or three times I did it, and it was pretty innocuous. It was sort of like this, what's the evidence base or whatever. I was, I was blocked. I'd never been blocked before. I was blocked by Shannon Rosa, the, 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 who's sort of taken over the whole thing. By, um, and, and now I can't, you know, I can, can no longer combat what they say directly. But yeah, the, the overwhelming number of people that have blocked me on Twitter, and I'm pretty nice, <laughs> have been, it's been over FC. Yeah. Interesting. I get blocked by, I don't, I'm not active on Twitter as much, but I have had a few psychics preemptively block me on Twitter, <laughs> even though I've never tweeted to them, but the, my name comes up and they're like, oh, this one's out of here. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll go to say something about like a psychic Tyler Henry. And it's like, you've been blocked. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> well, I guess he is psychic. He knew I was going to take him on next, but <laughs> <laughs> But you, you wonder about it. And you know what's interesting is about being blocked. I find this fascinating and is that if they block you, then they can't see what you're posting necessarily. So all you do is you do the hashtag and write their name anyway. And so when people are Googling your, you know, are, are on Twitter and they're looking for whatever it is, like the thinking the thinking yeah. autistic thinkers. What did you call it? The thinking the, the thinking person's guide to autism. Well, whatever their smaller acronym is, for yeah, their, um, and you yeah, hashtag yeah. that, and people are are googling it on Twitter, they're going to come up with your stuff. Yes, but that actual organization will not know what you're saying because they blocked you. So, well, what they'll do is people will go, and I can do the same to them. I can, you can go on in under a pseudonym and see oh yeah, that too. And then you could take a picture of it, and then you can write about it. But it takes that. It takes right. It's an extra step. But I mean, there's yeah. ways around it, and I can't understand why they're blocking people whenever they know that you could just get around it, and and it, it does feel like it's an extra step. But it's kind of furies you. You know, it makes you want yeah. to go more. Well, yeah. fine. You're gonna block me. Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make ten accounts, and we're gonna go yeah. <laughs> and, and, and in a different way. But it, can you give everybody where they can find you in your, your Twitter account name and everything for all those who are Yeah, watching? so it's see the name up there. It's, so it's just at Catherine Beals with no uh, space between the Catherine and the Beals. And it's um, K-A-T-H-A-R-I-N-E-B-E-A-L-S. Yes. And Janice, anything that you want to say that you, we should tell people to look for? <laughs> no. <laughs> Read the Wikipedia pages. Ding! Did a lot of work. They <laughs> Get educated. I mean, I feel like this is the third time that I've been speaking in length. So, you know, people pretty much are, know what I have to say. <laughs> Please keep Fine. sending me, you know, people send me articles and, and they keep me posted about events and court cases. And <laughs> so I really appreciate that because then I can get that out to um, somebody. What did somebody call me? They called me the uh, uh, the hub in a very, uh, in this. this yeah, yeah. Book. You are the hub. <laughs> So I have I have people that I'm in contact with around the world um, to varying degrees um, about FC and RPM and and um, I I learn a lot and I appreciate people keeping in touch. So it's, it, we've met really interesting people like Catherine. It's just so cool. <laughs> well, and there's a so, yeah. big silver lining for the whole thing, isn't there? It it's, is. it's it's yeah. really neat. And you know, once we start getting organized and talking to each other and we're sharing experiences and learning about the, this. You know, it's only a matter of time before we start seeing these universities go, well, I don't really think we should be endorsing pseudoscience. Maybe we should, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I live, I'm an optimist, so. I think it's really important to to put a human face on the people who are the critics as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's part of it. I, I'll share that's a, a good feeling point. story. Um, uh, uh, at the beginning of the year, someone emailed me and they were a facilitator and, um, they had seen my talk on um, Psycon? the Psycon talk that I did. And the person was questioning um, what was going on. They, there was enough doubt in their head and they saw that and they emailed and we exchanged emails for a little while and then it went silent. And um, about, I think about two weeks ago, 
I heard from the person again, and he said, you know, I, I listened to what you had to say, and I did some research on my own, and I'm not using facilitated communication anymore. And um, he said, it's a really complicated situation because the people at work still use it and still support it, but I've managed to get those people off my caseload for in one way or another, and doesn't believe in facilitated communication anymore. So I, I would say that the, 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 um, those are, are few and far between, but those are exactly the people that we're trying to, to connect with. Awesome. And we don't know, the other thing, uh, Craig Foster, I met mm -hmm. him at PsyCon and he, he said, you know, we get frustrated because we can see all the things that are happening with FC and RPM. But he said, if, if we hadn't been speaking out for all this time and continue to speak out, we don't know how many people that ha we've helped, you know, we're not going to hear from them. Probably. Absolutely. They, and they, so they learned and they moved on and we've never heard anything from them. Yeah. And I think the name calling on social media and, you know, I've seen some things that people have written about me, you know, in, in articles and things uh, The those, those hurt sometimes, but you know what the, 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 the goal of, of continuing to bring people up to date about what's going on with this and stop if we can stop one or two people you know i think that's great you know and i think at the that beginning we're helping, more, we're helping yeah. more than one or two people um so i appreciate what both of you are doing and you know it's i think that even though sometimes it gets frustrating i think it's it's um, this is a good yep. thing you know exactly what you mean all right you guys it's been so great talking to you. Nice meeting you, Catherine. It's been really fun. And I'll never look at a ceiling fan again the same way. <laughs> I've never lived in a house that had a ceiling fan, to be honest with you. I just not where we live here in California. It's it's not a thing. Well, I mean, sure there there are, but I've never <laughs> seen much of them. But so um, I'm gonna put this out on YouTube. And if other people watching are interested in following this conversation, which uh, it will be going on, there's so much to cover concerning facilitated communication and RPM. We'll be having many more talks. And there's already been two talks with Janice that are up on our YouTube channel. And you can find our information on About Time Project, which is the name of our YouTube channel. It's kind of hard to find because there's a movie out there called About Time. And they they <laughs> taken up all this uh, uh, taken up our name. How dare they? Even though they you need more subscribers. Yeah, I need a lot more subscribers. But you can uh, when you find our channel, uh, go and subscribe so that you will know whenever we've uploaded a new video. Also, you can uh, like us on Facebook. There's an About Time Project on Facebook, and if you click on that, you will know see all the events come up of all the other different lectures that uh, the other conversations I'm having with people and. Um, and so on. So there's ways of uh, finding this and, and learning about it. Our website is called abouttimeproject.org. And from there, you can find uh, uh, links to some of the information that, that Janice has been putting up there. Uh, I think it's called True Voices. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. On the True Voices. Yeah. We've put, um, we've put a bunch of article, research articles and newspaper articles about facilitated mm -hmm. communication mm -hmm. on there on the website. Plus, you can also find all the information on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. It's the one-stop shop to be able to find it really easily. But if you want to be in touch and, and know about the different lectures that are going on and stuff, or suggest anybody else, we are a 501c3 uh, organization. By the way, just saying our donate button is on our uh, abouttimeproject.org website. So. All right, you guys, it's been great talking to you. It's been two hours and seven minutes, but it was flew <laughs> by. It was so interesting, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye teddy bear. <laughs>